I'm talking today not so much about uh, the technicalities of translation. I'm really interested in language policy, and I'm interested in the fact that you're interested in language policy, it seems. At Stellenbosch, we are in the midst of a conversation, dialogue, debate, review of the university's language policy, and I'm following that as an outsider. I understand that the question at the center of the review is whether or not Afrikaans is to be used as a vehicular language in lectures such as the one I'm giving now. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm interested in it, I understand it, but I think as an outsider, I should do other things and talk about other situations. And you can translate from what I'm talking about to where you are. I cannot pretend to be neutral because I'm associated with a particular department and I'm associated with a particular kind of language solution known as translation. So beware. I'm not neutral. But the more important things that would locate what I want to say have to do with personal experience. Years ago, 7980, I taught in the Basque country in Spain, which is the bit at the left at the top. They used to have terrorist movements in favor of their independence. When I was there, nobody spoke the language we call Basque or Euskera. A few people did it in the countryside. There was a symbolic column in the newspaper, but it was nowhere near a standardized language and nothing like an academic language. When I return there now, everybody speaks it. The kids in the street speak it. Television, two television channels with lots of children's television. In that period, they have created a viable, vibrant, academic and social language. It can be done. Similarly, in Catalonia, where I now work, and we speak Catalan, we have uh, in Spain, as you might know, one official language for the entire territory, which is Spanish, and then in the particular regions, co-official languages, Catalan, Basque, and Galician. I work in a Catalan-speaking university, where the policy is to privilege Catalan, all official communication is in Catalan. People have the right to use Spanish, and everybody understands Spanish. And we're being encouraged to use more and more English. International students, Erasmus students, come in, and they're looking for more English classes, and so we try to provide them. Basque and Catalan have fewer than 10 million speakers. They are not disappearing. They are much stronger these days than they were 20 years ago. We could say the same for Irish and Welsh and a string of languages where there is a social will for these languages to manifest themselves and develop using the institutions and technologies of our globalized era. There is, for me, no fatality in the global movement towards English because I've lived these realities. My right to speak here, though, isn't so much personal experience as my involvement in a European research project called MIME, Mobility and Inclusion in Multilingual Europe, which is looking at this general problem in the European context. I uh, am in charge of a, a subgroup or a, a, a task on um, mediation as a set of solutions to multilingual problems or where multilingual communication needs some help, these are things you can do. And the solutions we're looking at are public service interpreting and translation. We're looking at the moment very much at the asylum seekers moving into Europe and how we handle that linguistically. Lingua francas, which is another kind of solution. English, obviously but also Esperanto. Intercomprehension. Intercomprehension is when, for example, I speak German and you speak Afrikaans and we can understand each other more or less. 
with a bit of learning, passive learning, in the other language, in the, within the same family, uh, people can continue to speak their languages and have a bilingual conversation. That is what I'm calling intercomprehension. Um, that's what it's called in this project. I would use intercomprehension, for example, between uh, if I go to Portugal or Italy, I would use that speaking Spanish. Uh, and then uh, translation technologies. What's the impact of the new technologies we have for translation? So we're actually comparing those with um, something that's done in a different task. We're comparing it with language learning, which is the big heavy gun solution to problems. But we're interested in not just translation, as you can see, and not just language learning, but all the things that can be done to bridge across languages when some help is needed. Now, this project has a model, and I think this is the thing I really want to bring to you. Once you get involved in these debates, they become complex, categorical, and acrimonious. And you don't know where you are. Here's a proposal to simplify things. It's not mine. It comes from François Grain, who is a professor of economics at the University of Geneva. He is head of this European project, which involves, I don't know, I think some 21 universities. It's, it's, it's a big project, uh, extremely interdisciplinary. But this is what economics brings to our problems. The supposition is this. It is desirable for our societies here, I guess, as in Europe, to have as much inclusion as possible. That is, we don't want people to be excluded from our societies. And it's desirable to have as much mobility as possible. Mobility simply means uh, it's more the geographical mobility than social mobility. We want people to be able to move around Europe because one of the principles is the free movement of labor. Uh, here you might want your students or yourselves to have a career here, in other parts of your country and in other parts of the world, and be trained for that mobility. So we have two conflicting or potentially conflicting ideals. Inclusion is one thing and mobility is another. And we want solutions that can serve both at the same time. So a solution that only gives us inclusion with no mobility is a poor solution. And the solution out here that only gives mobility and no inclusion is also a poor solution. Are we therefore locked into a perpetual contradiction or paradox or conflict of interest? No, not at all. Because there's a range of solutions, more or less along these moving lines, that allow a bit of both, that allow a trade-off. You can have a solution close up here that allows a lot of inclusion but and a little bit of mobility. Or a, a solution down here that allows a lot of mobility and a bit of inclusion. And you can have solutions that move between the two according to the circumstances. Now, all the things I just mentioned, that is public service interpreting, lingua franca, intercomprehension, and translation technologies are solutions that can be placed along that kind of line. Do allow trade-offs. Do allow both things at the same time. Hence their interest. Hence my interest in getting out of the categorical debate that says, if we don't have this, then we've got all of this. And if we've got all of that, when we don't have that. This problem is being faced by all our societies. What we have to do is to look for the trade-offs, the midway solutions. Now, any solution that enables it is good. That one is good. But this one out here is better because it enables more of both. So the challenge for our project is to find solutions that increase the availability of both goods. A solution is okay here, but it's better out there because you get more 
of both. So we know what a good solution is. All the economists do. The model is interesting because it allows us to talk about degrees of inclusion instead of just saying you're in or out. What inclusion means, though, if you get together a whole lot of disciplines, is a very ooh, vague thing. Everybody's got their ideas about it. In my own work, I choose to define it pragmatically as whether or not the second person is included in an utterance, if the, the receiver can occupy the position of the second person. Okay, I won't go into it now. It'll come back later in the talk, though. You, we can give a linguistic definition to inclusion, and I think it's very interesting to do so if we're talking about actual linguistic communication. And we can talk about degrees of mobility, which means I can uh, talk about our Erasmus or international students, as well as the waves of asylum seekers coming into Europe. And most importantly, the solutions that are most available, that allow most of both, tend to be the cheapest ones. It's legitimate in this model, it's done by economists, to talk about the costs, not just the financial costs, but how much individual effort has to go into preparing for the communication and carrying it out. So we can start to work out abstract formulas with respect to costs. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you any abstract formulas, but you can see where the economists take the model. I'm interested now in what that abstract model omits, the various things that we tend not to discuss enough when we talk about language policy, certainly when the economists come on, but the people in, in policy studies uh, also tend to forget about things like this. Within the research group, we have fundamental disagreements. We have people who believe that there are language rights and people who believe that there are no rights if there are no economic means to provide the good in question. That is, there's the realist position versus the idealist position. I'm a realist position. I don't believe there are language rights if there are no, not the economic means to provide the good in question. Time is missing. How long is this communication going to last? How long is the institution going to last? How long do we need a solution to the problem? The values of language, that whole question of what values people attach to different language, languages is omitted from the model. The sustainability of a solution is omitted and the very possibility of not having policy is omitted. And I want to very briefly look at all those points, if I have time, to tell you why they should be considered. I'm going to go very quickly about, uh, with respect to language rights, with the respect to the possibility that there are equal languages. I will point out merely that when I study medieval translation theory, the assumption of a hierarchy of languages is normal, and that translation works to develop the languages that are furthest from God. Uh, the Renaissance invented the idea or the ideal of equal languages, notably the national vernaculars, but it's not a stable idea and it's not an idea well suited to our age of globalization. Similarly, and for the same reasons, all languages have borrowing from other languages. Many of these borrowings come in through translation. There are no pure languages so why pretend they are? Uh, the, the very notion of what a language is uh, doesn't go in, enter into crisis because there are syntactic systems which are very strong, but the flow of lexical items and, and, and minor syntactic structures uh, to and from languages, often through translation, is something we have to accept these days. I tend to live in the kind of world that uh, sees people working multilingually, 
most of the world's people are multilingual, polyglots is the better term, and they're using some strong languages, and then a multiplicity of semiotic resources from other languages. And I'm far happier looking at that non-categorical view of what a language is. This concerns studies of diglossia especially and, and the, the general finding that in the world there are very few, if any, all-purpose languages. Uh, we tend to believe that a strong, pure national language is one you can do everything in that you want to do in your life. The social reality for most of us is that we do some things in some languages and some things in others. I'll move on to the time element. I think it's very key to consider carefully how long we want a solution to last. This is a model I drew after working as a translator for the Barcelona Olympic Games, 1992, a long time ago. The Olympiad is the four-year project leading to the Olympic Games. And I started working actually as a language teacher. I was at the university, we had a contract. I was teaching the executives so they would improve their English. This is in Barcelona, they're going to have to work in basically English, but French is very strong too within the Olympic Committee. So we're teaching languages and then we were translating at the same time. Both solutions. How would you know when to teach the language and when to translate? Well, there's a difference. When you're learning languages, the cost, the effort, the social effort and the individual cost decreases over time. It's pretty tough at the beginning. Learning a language is hard work. But after a while, you know, you never get to L1 status. You never get to that mother tongue status. But hey, you get quite good at it. And it's easier. Okay? Translation, on the other hand, along with a, a bundle of other solutions, but translation in particular, it gets a bit easier once you establish the glossaries. We know how to work with translators or how to work with interpreters. Sorry, I include interpreting within my general term, translation. But after that, hey, you have to pay everybody by the hour or by the word. It doesn't get cheaper. What's the message? Well, it seemed to me that if you've got a project lasting less than T1, then you translate more than you teach. If you've got a project lasting to T2, you combine the boat, you combine language and translation, okay? Roughly in the proportion of the areas underneath these curves. And I think that four-year project of the Olympic Games is about T2. But if you're going beyond that and you want to build up a country or build up multilingual Europe, which is a long-term undertaking, we think, then language learning is far more important than translation. Translation is useful for short-term solutions up here. Language learning is the big, heavy solution for long-term solutions. That's worrying to translators. Still, there it is. I think um, Four years is a nice measure because most of our students come in for four years or five years or six, so it's around there. And you can think about using two solutions at the same time in a certain proportion. When our students come to Catalonia, lots of them have some Spanish. They improve their Spanish, but they're made to confront the realities of Catalan. They have Catalan all around them. Uh, teach, uh, our Catalan classes are free and freely available. They're made to be quite fun and cool. Uh, so uh, do they all learn Catalan? No. Do they leave with an awareness of Catalan culture? Yes. Do they learn to respect the existence of that culture? I would hope so. I did. I have. But I've been there for a long time. That kind of analysis can be made more complex quite easily. 
And here's what we've done in our uh, task in the research project I, I've been uh, referring to. You'll see that here I've lined up our four solutions with language learning. And you, you've got the time frame, which is optimal and different for all of them. T technologies and translation solutions are for short-term solutions, the other are for longer. When we've, we've been doing interviews, though, with with users of, of uh, language services and with people coming into uh, what are unfortunately called detention centers for uh, asylum seekers and uh, seeing what they prefer, what are their criteria. The interesting things have been that they user independence is, is a very important criterion for most of the people involved in negotiating these problems. They don't particularly like the use of interpreters because they feel they have been disempowered. They have to rely on somebody else and they don't entirely trust anybody because anybody can be a, a spy sent by the government to get some data on where they've come from or why they are there. Uh, so things like that came out that user independence for the users is a very important criterion and actually works against uh, mediation by interpreters. And then there are some question marks. Can a lingua franca um, allow mediation, oh, sorry, inclusion in the society for our project? Yes, because I define it linguistically. So if people come in from Syria, they're speaking bad English, but somebody in, German, in, in Germany also speaks well, better English, they're communicating quite well in that lingua franca. Other people with a, a more social or idealistic notion of what inclusion means would say, no, there cannot be any inclusion if it's not in the national host language, in this case, German. So it's a matter of definition. But for us, there can be inclusion in the lingua franca because that's what we see happening around us in Europe. Be very careful. The rest of that, you can imagine how our discussions go. This is a, not definitive. This is an ongoing project. I could imply, apply the same kind of analysis to some other solutions. For example, giving the lecture here, you might notice I'm recording it in front of me. That will go on YouTube. It will go there with subtitles. It's quite easy to do. I do it myself. I also train people to do that. Very cheap solution for distributing knowledge. Not that I really call my stuff knowledge, but how it. Okay. Uh, that can be uh, compared using these same criteria uh, with simultaneous interpreting, which is uh, far more expensive and far more limited to the time frame. As we were discussing with a doctoral student yesterday, that solution will give you the sense of an event, of us being here in this room together around a particular object. It's an expensive thing to buy, that event, but it may have its values, whereas the subtitle videos means I can take this lecture, put it into two, three, or 11 other languages, distribute it internationally for free, and anybody, anywhere can have access to it which allows the most inclusion, depends what you mean by inclusion. And we have to go back to that, that particular value. Discuss it some more. I think I'm being generous in saying low inclusion. I watch my son watching YouTube videos all the time. He's definitely included in some kind of virtual community that I don't know anything about. I'll move on to the other points that are forgotten about too often. We seem to talk about languages as if they were tools and nothing but tools. Pick this up and use it to attain this effect. Research done by Brigitte Bush, who at the time was at uh, the University of Western Cape, yes, uh, working with the much regretted uh, uh, Neville Alexander. Uh, 
worked a lot on linguistic biographies, getting people, especially students, to write up what they remember about their languages, where they used it, where they learnt it, what values are associated with it. When you engage in this kind of activity, it, it comes very clear that languages are not equal. I could say this thing in, in three different ways. And they would be technically equivalent for a translation theorist, for example. But they're not equivalent according to how I feel about those languages, because of where they've come from, the baggage they're carrying. For example, for many years, I didn't like speaking English. I would give lectures in French, out of preference. Crazy I was then, but anyway, I've now come home. Uh, I still feel uneasy speaking Spanish in public and far better speaking Catalan for reasons that have to do with history and uh, recent history in Spain, I guess. Recent it means in the last 40 years or so. Those things are there and are motivating a lot of what goes into the debates on language policy. And if you don't talk about them, they, they don't reach any solution. You'll find people arguing at cross purposes because of the values attached to the languages and where these people are coming from. I see this very much in Catalonia with our discussions about language. I think it's important, therefore, to realize that rather than say all languages are automatically equal before the law, that the value of a language is ultimately performed by people every time they speak and use it. And this is frustrating for the people who want to have policy as, as a rule that can then be applied and regulate social action. Social action doesn't work that way. The values are instilled by the people who use the language in each particular situation. This goes into a lot of performativity studies, gender studies especially, the idea that our gender is not what we're born with, it's something we create as we act in each moment of our lives. Language is the same. The valorization of languages is the same. How do you get positive, effective values into a language? And this is where the two success stories that I've started with have played it very well. This is a Catalan class in Melbourne, Australia. <clears throat> Kids who are born into Catalan-speaking families who want to maintain the language, go along and get a class. Oh, they're practicing an open vowel there, I suspect. No, they're having fun. And, and the trick of, of getting Basque and Catalan into positions where they are uh, now established powerful languages is they started with children's television, getting the best children's television, getting the best fun and games, making that language associated with future events, uh, with yeah, a certain degree of social mobility, it's it, it sure as well. But, but more importantly, the children want to speak that language because it's cool. And then you want to analyze what that word cool means. But there it is. They're having fun. Okay, I like Catalan because you have fun with it. And from there you can associate it also with where I can go with it, how I can be with certain kinds of people with it. If you're not doing that, if you come in and have your language policy regulating what happens at university level, I'm sorry, but you're, what's the expression? Closing the door, the gate, after the horse has bolted. The the values are in place, and you're trying to regulate them as if languages were equal. They're not, because that's been those kinds of values have been instilled into some languages more than into others. So our abstract rules and regulations come sadly amiss if we're not doing that kind of long-term work on the values associated with a language, giving us motivation to use and enjoy our languages rather than a regulation that penalizes the use of one or the other. One of the other things that's missing from the model 
was what's these day, what is these days called sustainability. But that's a very loose term. I, I'm reading here uh, from a book, a recent book last year, I think, Pascal Chabot, L'Age des Transitions, The Age of Transitions. And Chabot p- picks up the point that uh, we no longer talk about revolution. You know, we were all radical leftist Marxist not long ago, and we all sought the ideal revolution, and it was going to happen. And it hasn't happened. And then our terminology changed. If you look around us, so much is talked about in terms of transition. And the important thing is the movement towards. In Catalonia, we have a radical independence movement, which is not going to seek a revolution. We're not going to kill anybody. We're not going to have an army. Yeah, okay. Some people would like to. but And the term they use for that is al proces. The process. We are going towards something, and the going towards it is more important or as important as the goal. We want to be independent, but in the meantime, hey, we can gain some respect and understanding and open a a new dialogue with people in our part of the world. That sense of importance being attached to the means rather than the end, says Chabot, is something new. The great disasters of the 20th century came from revolutionaries who said the end justifies the means. Young people today, texting, googling, can get information about what they're doing in the world and who they're voting for and where their products are made. And they can be very aware of the different processes that are going on around them and suspicious of anyone who comes up with a new immediate revolutionary goal, such as, for example, imposing one language on everybody. Sustainability means paying attention to the means and not destroying things as you go along. And I'm just taking one point from this book, and it's actually something I'm stealing from Michael Cronin, who has also stolen from this book. Mobility is a value in our model. It's good for people to get to where they want to go. Okay? So our cities build motorways, highways, freeways. We call them freeways, like that wonderful one in Cape Town that still doesn't go anywhere. (laughs) And that's a good thing. All our cities do that. But if you want a sustainable city, you also think about having public bicycles. You know, where you the the, the municipality provides free bikes or very low-cost bikes, and you ride somewhere and leave it, and somebody else comes back. One of these solutions is focused on getting people to where they want to go as fast as possible, because the end justifies the means. The other kind of solution says, hey, enjoy the trip, take it slow, do some exercise, look around you, talk with people, enjoy the transition. Apply that to your time at a university, for example, or my students in my university. What do we want to give them? Straight access into a job or a process, a transition? Classical humanistic education, which means you can look around and discover things along the way. And one of the things that you can discover along the way is the plurality of languages around you. How many languages have I learned? I don't know. I think I started to learn about 10. Have I got to any kind of competence in perhaps five? Something, perhaps. But there's no reason to think that the purpose of me beginning to learn Arabic, was to become a native speaker of Arabic. No, I enjoyed learning that. And I I enjoy using the bit that I know. Why not? So this is part of my argument against categorical thought in language policy, especially in an education institution. It shouldn't be one or the other as if it were black and white. Itamar Evans Zoha makes a valuable point talking about Galician. Galician is the, the third 
co-official language in Spain, which has been less successful in establishing itself. And he says, well, it's true. Your language planning didn't work as well as the others. You didn't have the children's television as great as the others, or you, you didn't do so many translations into the language. But he says, even though you didn't get to that goal, you have put energy into the system. Okay, here's Mr. Poly systems theory, but he sees cultures as systems, and what a system needs in order to survive and sustain itself is intellectual energy. And the very debate about language, the, the debate about policy, generates that energy and helps form the community. <clears throat> I've been discussing these things with Florian Kuhlmas, a German, Greek-born German social linguist, very critical social linguist. And he asked me over lunch, why shouldn't we just let languages grow like grasses in the field? Why should we go and try to regulate them and say where one should be and the other should not be? Why do we need language policy after all? And my answer, because I knew it was coming, my answer was from Habermas, that if we are living in a society that has true communication, we all feel we are co-authors of our laws. We need discussion and debate to a level where the laws is not somebody else addressing me, but I am one of the co-authors of the laws and will therefore defend those laws. It's a very, very high measure of inclusion. Very interesting to analyze pragmatically. If you have that ideal that everybody should feel co-authors of their laws, then you need public education. The state has to be involved in public education. And since you have public education, you need language policy. And I think that's the only reason. The rest sorts itself out very well. You know SAS? Is it Scandinavian Airline Systems? These are the Scandinavian countries up there. They have no language policy. The language policy says problems in multilingual problems will be solved in a Scandinavian way. Full stop. <laughs> huh? and so they use actually lots of intercomprehension. They switch to English when they have to, and, and they do some language learning in order to get the intercomprehension going. But there is no language policy because people solve these things very well by themselves. Public education, though, is more important. That problem is not peculiar to this place, or Catalonia, or the Basque Country, or a multilingual Europe. That problem occurs in all our urban societies, because mobility is everywhere and globalization is a part of our urban environment. Working on that problem means solving the most profound or overcoming the most important impediment to a viable community in a globalized electronic age. We're working on the building of paradises. That's how important the problem is. That's why it's important to look for some creative, non-categorical, non-restrictive solutions. To summarize, with respect to translation, which was my topic, it's good for short-term solutions, I suggest. It should be used for high-risk, high-value texts of really important stuff because it's expensive and it can only be justified then. And it should be used in combination with language learning and intercomprehension and a lingua franca, code mixing, code switching, all these other things you can see and hear around you. Language is not to be associated with identity. I was in a train in Melbourne overhearing students speaking, wondering what happened to my poor Australian accent. And they're saying, yeah, that lecture was like awesome. Oh, thank God, these guys. They've got this broad Australian accent, so they really identify with the place. 
and they've adopted this American terminology of youth culture. Language is a wonderful thing. You can have two identities at the same time in language doing different things on different levels. If we have this wonderful tool at our disposal, I suggest we use more of it. Thank you.